When you dare to share, you break the silence. When you dare to share, you speak your truth. When you dare to share, you use the full strength of your voice. When you dare to share, it brings opportunity to own your story. So tell it, be heard, and at the same time, your sharing is someone else's learning, inspiration, motivation, empowerment, and hope. There's always an element to each of our stories that remains a secret. For some, we feel it's a dirty little secret. Dare to Share Your Untold Story exposes these secrets in a welcoming and positive way. I encourage each of you out there to dare yourself to share what is yours to tell. When we dare, it is the courage to do something really important. Let this be a vow to each and every single one of us that we take risk, we brave, confront, and face what is, while inspiring and empowering all communities. So let's break that silence and tap into mental beauty. This is Salima Jadavji, your podcast host, a practicing social worker, and your mental wellness connoisseur. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast, episode number 70. The pressure cooker feeling on repeat and confidence contingent on a faulty narrative. To all my fellow listeners, before we get started, I'm just dropping in a note to give you a heads up that this podcast might be emotionally triggering for you. We do invite guests onto the show who share openly about extremely difficult life moments with exposure and impact of what the struggles have been like. The intensity of each episode could have a variable impact on your emotional and mental well-being based on your own personal story. If at any point the topic becomes uncomfortable or upsetting to you in any way, please do not pressure yourself to listen. Instead, be kind to yourself, do some self-care, and perhaps give another episode a try. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our courageous and daring guest, Rafia Ahmed. Rafia is intuitive, fearless, and wise, stretching individuals to take inspired action to create the life they never knew they could have through understanding their identity, intuition, impact, and influence. Rafia leverages her unique field lessons to serve individuals who are on their pathways to self-discovery and healing from burnout and suffering from poor mental health experiences that hinder their life's fullest expression. After many challenges of her own, Rafia lost her self-identity, which ultimately led her to discover her purpose and who she is today. She hosts a podcast called Follow Your First Mind and has established her very own coaching program, which is named Rafia Ahmed Coaching, where she teaches clients how to trust their first minds. Rafia's passions consist of faith, leadership, and especially teaching young people how to become powerful leaders. Well, hello, Rafia. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast. Hello, hello. I'm so excited to be here, Salima. Thank you for having me. Oh my goodness, Rafia. I'm so happy that you're excited because I'm extremely excited as well, you know, just to even have this opportunity to have you as a guest on the show. That's actually really important because it's guests like yourself that have so much to offer the audience and for people to hear your story can inspire so many. And I'm really grateful that you have this willingness to be here today. You know, I feel really blessed and just hope that um, we continue to have guests like yourself to come on the show and share their insights and inspirations and, and have the space to share what they, what, what's needed. So I hope that I'm actually very excited to, to see what comes up in our conversation today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And I too, I, I will say in agreement with you, you know, um, I also hope that uh, many more, you know, here's to 70 more amazing, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> amazing podcasts I love uh, it. with amazing guests. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it really is important that, you know, we take a stance together to help break barriers of mental stigma. So I have a lot of gratitude that you're here today. Okay. And in case you're still wondering, this podcast is really all about bringing forward untold stories that people go through, whether directly about a mental health struggle or something else. And one thing that we know is that no matter the story, there is impact on one's own mental health in some way. And typically, 
it remains tucked away. And so this platform, it serves in a way to break barriers of mental stigma that have been conditioned in our society. So the beautiful thing about our conversation is today, together, you and I will be able to encourage people to share and and tell what individuals typically have reservations to express. And of course, I continue to bring forward a trend. It's called the mental beauty rethink. Rafiat, I'm inching to learn about this perspective of yours. Please tell me what comes to mind first when you hear these, when you hear this phrase, the mental beauty rethink. First thing that comes to mind is acceptance. Um, Mm. And I really love that phrase, the mental health beauty rethink. I think it, for me, just means accepting my mental health for what it is and where I am, right? Um, And so I think there's a lot of beauty in that. And so I really love, I actually really, really love it. Oh, that's so nice. I've heard so many different insights and inspirations that people tell me when they share this. I think you're the first, I don't know if you're the first person, but at least the way you've articulated, you're mentioning a self-acceptance of where my mental health is at and where I am as a result of it. It's this opening of an experience, right? Yes, Mm. yes. I, like, I really believe that life flows from you um, with in tandem of life happening to you, right? Mm-hmm. It's this harmony, harmony that kind of happens in co-creation. And so when you can accept your own mental health and, you know, you know, see the beauty in what you go through, you can make life beautiful as well, right? I think that's kind of the point of life. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I love it. And yeah. paying attention to the process. Exactly. It, it doesn't have to be based on good or bad or right or wrong. Just mm-hmm. what is. Exactly. Oh, man. <laughs> I know we'll, <laughs> we'll get into that a little bit later, but that's literally been, mm-hmm. you know, okay. really huge for me is really understanding that it is what it is. And what it is doesn't mean that I am a bad person or this is a bad thing or I'm a good person or that's a good thing or, you know, it's just that's what happened. Mm-hmm. full period you know yeah. no judgment. <laughs> we don't have to exactly. add the, exactly the other stuff <laughs> right yeah exactly no judgment yeah. just acceptance right yeah yeah mm-hmm. this is just such a lovely take okay i love it nice all right Rafia. i'm mm-hmm. you know getting ready to get into that nitty-gritty of your untold story i hope you are too Yes. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Okay, let's go for it. Okay, that first question, Rafiat, give us the newspaper headline of how you would title your untold story. How would it read? Okay, so it would read, How Owning My Mental Health Journey Has Liberated Me From Financial Shame. Okay, let me see if I got it. How Owning My Mental Health Journey Liberated Me From Financial Shame. Can you give us a little teaser, a little little inside scoop about what this means to you yeah for sure so of the the quick little what's about um Mm -hmm. hmm, I think the best way to put it for the listeners is I've moved over 16 times in my life and yeah it's been hectic but through all in all I've seen that um my finances was always kind of playing that part of the big bad villain, right? Mm -hmm. Um, If it wasn't for this, you know? Mm -hmm. And really what I realize now in this transformative journey in my life is how much making my finances a villain has really allowed me to fall deeper and deeper into a poor mental health experience, into depression and anxiety, um, even into suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, starting at a young age until now, just realizing that so much can happen. Right. <laughs> so obviously, you know, so much can happen. Right. Um, so much can happen. And if it, regardless of how much is layered on top, you know, you can still be free. Right. Okay. That's a lovely title and a really good preamble to just get right into yeah. your <laughs> untold story. So Rafiat, tell us what your untold story is all about. Um, so I'm going to pick a time because my own story, as you know, we spoke, it's, it's really my whole life journey, but I want to really focus in on a time when I was about, um, I want to say I was 18 or 19. Um, I don't think I was 20 yet. And, uh, my family and I, I lived at the time with my mom, my sister, um, my parents were divorced recently and, um, I lived with my mom and we decided to buy a home. Um, however, prior to 
prior to purchasing this home, my mom actually fell really, really ill Mm -hmm. in terms she had to uh, leave work. She fell ill at work and she was in the hospital for about six months or so. So I just want to set that up to to show you like the main breadwinner of the household is ill. Right. Um, So it can make sense. So we bought this house um, because we knew how much my mom, uh, she's from Jamaica and coming to this country, one of her biggest dreams was that owning a home and being able to provide a home for her family. So we decided to just, you know, okay, even though she's sick, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and do this. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we did it. We bought the home. Things were going well for a while and then they weren't right. Um, Slowly things were starting to just kind of fall apart financially. We weren't able to upkeep the payments of the mortgage and the other bills Mm -hmm. in the home and Mm -hmm. about uh, two you know, three years into buying that home, we had to make a decision, right? It was either this house is going to be foreclosed or mm-hmm. we need to sell it as quickly as possible Okay. or come up with the money, right? Okay. So Rafiat, before this, you've, you've had similar, because uh, you said you moved 16 yes. times in your life. So yes. that goes yes. with the assumption that prior to this at age 18 yeah. and, and two to three years, at, you know, during this time period, before that you had some moves as well and unexpected first move yeah so the first move was an expected one that one was happy we moved we grew up in a a low-income neighborhood Mm -hmm. in the west end of toronto we were just so excited like yes you know what's that Mm -hmm. we're moving on up you know Mm -hmm. that whole Mm -hmm. you know uh, air of celebration yeah Uh, we moved into a host uh, a home in mississauga and at the time my parents were still together my father was supposed to be looking after the mortgage and my mom the other expenses in the home mm-hmm. um after about four years we come to find out that oh no um he hasn't been paying the mortgage oh. and now we also we have to leave or it's gonna we have to sell sorry or it's gonna be foreclosed mm. and so that was very difficult for me um because at that time i believe i was about 13. Okay. Uh, no, fourteen. Okay. Yeah, I think I was in grade nine, and it was it was hard because as a young girl, one I just moved to the new city, right? right. <laughs> I was in Toronto, as I said, right. so it was adjustment in itself, mm-hmm. being in like a very suburbia neighborhood, like right. first you know when they just broke ground kind of areas. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was really hard for me because I started looking at finances as as I said, the bill and it started, that's right. when it really started becoming like, okay, if we can just have the money, you know, if money in my family just worked out, then we wouldn't be going to these problems. Mm-hmm. Because to me, at the, sorry, at the time I will mention as well, is when my mom decided to leave my dad. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and for prior to that, you know, I thought everything was fine. You know, I was You're definitely living a, a, right. yeah, a mm-hmm. sheltered <laughs> life. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, come to find out, you know, kind of that, that rug was pulled from under me me so that um, must have been shocking as well right because you you had no idea you were just being a teenager doing your thing and your exactly. parents were doing theirs and you all of that exactly. information would have come at a, a big surprise yeah. and shock it, it it truly was i i didn't i didn't know how to process it mm-hmm. and i think that's part of the reason why i'm so passionate about young people today mm-hmm. um because at the age i didn't know i just started watching tv um, like that was my outlet. I, I ate, mm-hmm. I watched TV. Um, I don't know if we could talk about it on here, but I self pleasured. I realized that was a thing and that's what I did to cope. Um, and I started thinking about, okay, how can I start making this work for myself? Like, how can I contribute to family? How can I contribute to life? So then my parents didn't have to be so stressed or didn't have to, you know, I started taking some ownership of my life. Um, it, what it really sounds like, though, is that you were trying to figure out how to save your family and how to fix it all. Yeah, yeah in in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> in my mind at that time. Mm-hmm. I really thought that, mm-hmm. okay, I could, I could try to, you know, get a job and contribute some mm-hmm. way so that they don't have to have so much pressure. Mm-hmm. Um even though I'm the youngest of the family, right? My sister is older than I. And she was also working and helping and things like that. But I just felt like, okay, maybe this is happening because I wasn't working or Mm. I wasn't doing enough. That's a lot of pressure you put on yourself. I did. I did because Mm I I think now what I know about myself is I I was a little bit of a perfectionist Mm -hmm. um, and wanting things to be just right. right. And so how do I, in my worldview, make things just right Mm -hmm. um so I try to do what I can Mm -hmm. um 
I did things, you know, as I got older, as I said, you know, we moved and they'd separated. We, we got an apartment at the time and then we bought the house and, you know, those feelings just exasperated, right? Like now my father's not here. And so now I have to step up, right? I have to try my best to alleviate the stress off my mom. Um, as I said, she got sick. So I was just trying my best to do what I could. And I remember, uh, I was actually just sharing this with her last night. I was, I was telling her that I remember I was probably, yeah, 18 at the time, Mm -hmm. looking into medical um, clinics that, medical trials um, that pay you a certain amount for doing, you know, trying pharmaceutical drugs that are Mm not, um, you know, finished being tested. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a risk because they're not finished being tested. You are the test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I was still willing to do it because I I wanted to do whatever I could um, that was still in the realm of quote unquote ethical or legal. You know, I, I told you I grew up in a low income neighborhood, mm-hmm. so I was a gra- I was around um, illegal activity growing up somewhat. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I understood what that looked like. I have new friends and even family who has gotten in trouble with the law. So mm-hmm. I didn't want to go that route. Right. So you didn't want to um, go down that path. But it mm-hmm. also seemed like, OK, how do I take this to the furthest extreme that I can <laughs> exactly, to control exactly. the situation <laughs> exactly. and further put pressure okay. on yourself <laughs> yes. to the nth degree? <laughs> yeah. OK. Yeah. Because I really mm-hmm. thought like, OK, if if I was contributing, then I can, you know, I can do something here. Right. Right. Because mm-hmm. um, I also at the time I worked for a um, the city of Toronto, which is at the time it was like. I felt like it was, it was I was supposed to be making good money. I was supposed to be doing all these things and, you know, supposed to be, supposed to be, supposed to be, you know? Right. <laughs> and so right. I, I thought I really could do more and I should be able to do more. Um, really telling myself, uh, giving myself a lot of obligation um, and responsibility, trying to control the way my family was living or the direction, mm-hmm. trajectory, I should mm-hmm. say, that my family was going down. Um so yeah, I, yeah, I really, I, you know, a, a part of that story is I, I tried to do the trial and I remember being on the bus heading into, at this time I was a little bit older, I was going to York. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, I must've been 19 because now first year in college, I was that too, well, university. And I was like, okay, what can I do? And I remember being on the bus and heading to class and getting the call from the from the clinic and them telling me that I can't do it because my BMI um, body mass index was too high for my height. Mm -hmm. And I remember just like bawling and trying to reason with them and trying to explain to them like, no, it's okay. I just have big boobs and I just have like a big, you know, like just my body shape, you know, like I have nice big thighs. Like I'm just that kind of girl. Like, you know, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, (laughs) really mm -hmm. trying to let them know that, you know, don't listen to what your paper says. Listen to me. You just were uh, that desperate to have the yeah. control and yes. it was a, a desperate measure, right? Like you yeah. must have been feeling time was desperation, going. right? Exactly. Time was limited for you. The time was limited. We had to get this money mm-hmm. in time. Like that's how it works. You know, you have to be able to sell your house in time or pay this by this certain time, right? right? Or the bank is going to take action. That's just what they do. That's a lot of um, emotional upheaval that was probably oh entangled gosh. in all of that <laughs> thought process too, do right? See? Yeah. And as I said, I wasn't really, I wasn't, I wasn't coping with it the best, mm-hmm, right? Since mm-hmm. the time the first happened when I was a younger teenager, mm-hmm. I was using those other forms to cope. And so I just continued. I never actually spoke to anybody about what I was going through or what was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would tell my friends like, yeah, this happened. You know, they'd be like, oh, you know, it's okay. Right. <laughs> You'll be okay. Um, but they might not but... have understood the extent of it either. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I didn't really expect them to because at the time when I, the big shift for me when moving to Mississauga was, um, or I guess the perception I had was these people don't really understand what it's like to have to be in low income. So that was my, I guess, lens, my bias that I came in with. So I didn't think my friends would really even understand what I was going through. Right. I don't know if that's true, but that's what it was at the time. But that's kind of what you were experiencing or how you felt. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So tell One me the about, big catalyst. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you're you just about to mention the word catalyst. So I was going to ask you, what, what were some of the narratives that kind of were in your mind that kind of kept you going in the cycle? I mean, I know some of them had faulty patterns, but what can yeah. you shed light to what some of those were? Yeah, I, 
I really like one of the biggest ones was if I can just, you know, get my money together, if I can just get myself together around money, then everything would be fine. Right. Like if I can just earn enough, if I can just understand it, if I can just, you know, be able to save enough, if I can, you know, everything is I'm not enough, essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. Whatever I do is not enough. Um, So that was a really big one. A second one was that I just was not smart enough. Um, I wasn't capable enough to fix this situation. Mm -hmm. And so I did, you know, over and above to try to fix things Mm -hmm. and various areas, you know, like, you know, these things lead into other things in your life. Of course. Of course. Um, So, yeah, I would say that's probably the biggest ones. What about your mindset with, with money? At the time, I think it was really, it was, <laughs> I would say it was probably like a double-edged sword because mm-hmm. uh, at the time I worked in recreation and I was um, a coordinator of a, a few programs. And so I made more money than typical. Mm-hmm. So I made good money, quote unquote. So I love to see my paycheck when it arrived. But at the same time, by the Saturday, I was mm-hmm. like, no, like what happened? Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it would then just quickly turn into to an experience where I couldn't stand looking at my bank account. I couldn't stand looking at my money. I couldn't understand what's happening. Why is it that I could never make it for someone who makes quote unquote good money? Why can't I make it to the other, to the next pay period? Mm-hmm. Like this doesn't make any sense, right? Mm-hmm. I would, you know, do all the stuff, the budgets, the the books, the videos, the everything, everything to, to try to figure out out and yet um it still wouldn't work for me so i think my mindset around it was like i am the problem wow that's very intense right so you're basically yeah. saying i can make it but i can't keep it so what's not yeah. working it must be me yeah yeah okay because mind you as a coordinator i deal with budgets <laughs> right. i can do budgets mm-hmm. for the programs so right. why is it that i can't right. do this so you're like i understand life. all of this i do this yeah. day in and day out i i got this yes. for others yeah mm-hmm. right because obviously the background the history you know it's growing up you know money doesn't grow on trees and we don't have money for that and those are things playing in the background too Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. also a few minutes ago when we were just talking about you going to like the nth degree to like do what you needed to do in whatever way you mm-hmm. could to earn that money, you might have had that as like a pattern too, right? Do what's necessary yeah. to have money. Oh, yes. And yes. oh, the root of all negative Irony stuff means... must be related, you know, here. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. all the negative stuff that happens is because of money. Like, did you ever think like yes. that as well? Yes, yes. Thank you for for hearing that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, definitely everything that that happened because, as I said, although I moved sixteen times and all of them were not negative, the majority of them were. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think in my mind, I just now looked at money as this thing that just gobbles up my dreams, mm. right? Like I was always a big dreamer, always a person who knew I would be great somehow mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um yet i can't get anywhere because of this money right i can't do the things i want to do because of this money right um obstacle that was your yeah, big obstacle right. the common denominator yeah. obstacle and that's yeah the narrative that you had and yeah. you mentioned that you know you didn't speak to anyone about this when you were going through all of these things and you were coping and you weren't expecting friends to understand when you would share a few things but I'm, I'm curious, did you just show up happy and, you know, on the outside, just kind of go with the flow and not let people really in? Oh, yes. um, so like, was it like a different like experience on the inside? Yeah, yeah. I was very much so the, I'm an extrovert introvert. So very much the life of the party, um, get everybody together. Um, I'll the good girl right like I always I grew up also with that narrative I should say I was very much the good girl the one who was obedient so I was always the person who did what was expected of me Mm -hmm. but inside very sad very angry actually and I think that I took it out Mm -hmm. on my mom for a lot of years Mm -hmm. um now we have a great relationship we've been able to work through a lot Mm -hmm. but I was very angry with her because I really blamed her as well like I years before we we had to sell it me and my sister wanted to sell it there's many times we're like listen this is not working (laughs) let's cut our lashes and go and and Mm -hmm. at the time she was holding very on she was holding very tightly to her dream and i I had a lot of unforgiveness 
And so it came up as resentment, bitter anger, anger towards um, even like my friends, like they had, you know, parents who were able to give them things. Like I remember my friend, her, her grade 12 graduation, her dad gave her a car. And I remember being so upset that, wow, you know, mm-hmm. I'm mad at him for being a good dad. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. how dare he, you know, mm-hmm. provide mm-hmm. for his kids? <laughs> right. Um, so that was pretty much underneath it. And it would be expressed itself in various forms. If I got mad about something, then you would see it. Um, right. I wasn't a fighter, but I would do, I would make your life really, really hard. I was very, I could become very, very vindictive. Um, so I tried my best not to go that far. Mm-hmm. Um I try my best to even push anger underneath the surface because in my household, anger wasn't acceptable emotion either. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of trying to bottle it up Mm -hmm. and just continue. Right. And so then you very much for sure was like, you were a different person on the inside than outside. And, you know, I, I can't imagine what that was like for you as you actually were going through all of those different aspects, right? You know, like there's just so much that you endured and nowhere to turn. You were also mentioning something about, you know, doing that good girl thing, that being obedient and doing what's expected of you. And it also sounds like there's a part of you that had this, this story conditioned that you also had some of your own ideas of what was expected of you, but they might've been your own expectations unknowingly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I had to succeed. There was no, there was no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Like to me, success, I knew from a young age that I wanted to be in business. So that's all I kind of really focused on. But every time I tried to be in business somewhere or another, it didn't quite work out. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, or in my mind, it didn't work out. I'll say, um, so I felt like I had this undue pressure of, okay, I just need to prove to everyone that I can do this on top of whatever they're telling me they feel like I should be doing. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Cause it's like, Raph, you're good at this. You should be doing that. Like uh, I was, um, you know, growing up here, um, French is our second language. And so I was in French immersion. And so that was my identity for a long time, mm-hmm. uh, being the Frenchy, the French one. <laughs> right. So there was an expectation that I had to be, right. you know, I had to be uh, good and, and great at what I did, mm-hmm. good at school, good job, good, you know, just everything has to be good because my parents already poured so much into me by making me learn a second language <laughs> right. in itself. I feel like I just really wanted to... I just wanted to be grown because I felt like if I could just be grown, I would figure I would do life better than right. <laughs> everyone trying to tell me they could do life, you know, mm-hmm. trying to tell me what I can, I can do yeah. or what I should be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I always was a person who wanted to walk to my own drum, but just not being able to do that because of the conditioning of having to be a good girl. Right. Um, having to be the girl who was always happy. Like I was mm-hmm. pretty much a happy child. And so that's expected. So I wasn't really ever allowed to show emotions of, you know, as I said, anger or bitter, even well, sadness. I, was it really that you weren't allowed to show them or that they wouldn't mm-hmm. be received well if you, sh- if you expressed a different emotion? Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't be received well. Mm. Um, and so because of yeah. that, you then told yourself, I don't have permission to do this. I'm not allowed exactly. to do this. Okay. Exactly. Well, look at that. Another narrative. Yeah. And it just showed up differently and mm-hmm. different. Like yeah. looking back, I can see that how that showed up in relationships mm-hmm. and like romantic relationships. I can see how that showed up in friendships. I can see yeah. how that showed All up across in work relationships. The spectrum yeah. of your life in different facets. Yeah. yeah. Can you unpack for me this idea of confidence your your confidence being contingent to your financial success can you say more about that yeah because um as i said earlier working for the city i had this air of um how higher than thou you know mm-hmm. like i did well for myself i have this good job i'm making good money and like mm-hmm. i i put a lot of confidence on the external mm-hmm. and you know it being a person I also even say like pretty privileged, right? Like I knew I was an attractive person. And Mm so I I really utilized these things, Mm -hmm. but I never really felt deep down inside um, 
Oh, actually, I can't say that. Because I thought I was confident. Like, I thought I was confident through and through until life showed me that. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, not so much, baby girl, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. we got mm-hmm. some work to do here. But I, I put a lot of, because I put my confidence in the external so much, once the external things start getting taken away, you know, they're also like my confidence mm-hmm. in who I am. Well, because that's, I think when I hear you talk about that, it reminds me of like when we're looking at self-esteem, right? So Mm self-esteem is very much something that can only be measured by those external markers. And so if we're relying on external validation, which sounds like you were from what Mm -hmm. you're sharing, is that the self-esteem will also bounce up and down dependent on like if it's you know, if, we're, if you're being recognized, if you're getting that award, if you're getting the high five, yes. you're getting that recognition, then your esteem builds. Um, yes. But be, and I think that's what you're trying to tell me is that all of those external factors is where your emphasis was. Um, yes. And you probably didn't develop any of those finer skills of showing yourself or learning how to apply compassion towards yourself oh no (laughs) (laughs) that was all very recent (laughs) right and the self-compassion when we give ourselves that self-love and that compassion that's Mm -hmm. what actually ignites the inner confidence yes it has nothing to do with your esteem at that point because your confidence becomes solid yeah, I'm definitely someone who is more grounded now mm-hmm. because of my journey. If yes. I can go a little bit into that. Yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, before I left that job, uh, my, my last full time with the city, I was a youth outreach worker. Love the job, love working with youth, but I couldn't stand the workplace environment. Mm-hmm. But I love the thrill that it gave. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm just setting the stage with that one. At the same time, um, I felt because of that work environment, I started to really experience a lot of anxiety. Um, And then at the the same time, you know, I'm in a relationship which now looking back, I see it as emotionally abusive. And I'm like, wow, you know, so that's playing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Coupled with, as I said, this is all a part of the the 16 moves. Mm -hmm. They're all happening Mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. So there's a lot of instability happening. Um, So I was really losing myself, really becoming um, very depressed. I was I was a high functioning depressed person, meaning, you know, at work, nobody knew, you know, unless you're very close to me. Right. uh, Meaning like my sister um, Mm -hmm. really didn't know what I was truly feeling on the inside. Even that partner I tried to share didn't quite work. Mm hmm. I tried to seek help um, with a therapist at the time, but it didn't, didn't, we didn't mesh, you know what right. I mean? Um, she suggested antidepressants and I flipped out. Like I completely went into denial. Mm. I was like, no mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, because I was thinking about suicide and I was, you know, thinking about, okay, maybe if I just don't, maybe if I don't commit suicide, but maybe, you know, if I just, you know, get into a car accident, what if I just get hurt and then I can just be off. Then I can just, you know, like I, the thoughts start to get really, really um, concerning, right? Um, and that's when I really started to have pause with myself and really start to look at, okay, Raf, what's happening here? Mm-hmm. These thoughts are happening mm-hmm. a lot more often. Um, right. And I didn't know much about law of attraction and spirit and intuition then. But what I knew was if I keep thinking these things, I might call this into my life. Right. You, know, you had that at least that reality check yeah, moment where you're like, I've got to, you know, venture on yeah. a different path. I've got to try something new. Yeah. Whatever this thought process that I'm down, yeah, I it definitely... could make me doomed. <laughs> like you were kind yeah. of wondering that. Okay. Yeah. I was driving on the 401 mm-hmm. just really, and I think it was literally a divine moment. And that was just super clear. It was just like, bro, if you keep thinking this, this might happen, you know? Mm. Um, and I was like, okay, okay. Um, so... I, at the time, I really started to feel hopeful, but not very. Like it was still very clouded, right? Um, but I was there was like a glimmer s- or a sparkle a glimmer, of something for yes. you there was to kind of hold on to. So yes. It was something new. Yes, it was something new. That's mm-hmm. a perfect way to put mm-hmm. it. It was something new. 
And then at the time, this is December. So at the time, this is probably happening for four years. Mm. Um, and at 2018, December, my eldest brother passes away. Oh, I'm so and sorry it's to jarring. Hear about that. that must Thank have you. been so jarring. Yeah, it was jarring because mm-hmm. it was very sudden. And this is when the thoughts are very prominent in my head. And I'm thinking to myself, as he's being lowered into the lowered into the ground, mm-hmm. I'm thinking to myself, this is what you want. This mm-hmm. is what you're asking for. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Looking around at the people around us and feeling the grief, you know. Um, it really was an eye opener for me. Um, but I, I wish I can say I changed everything then, but I didn't. It still took a year. Um, but it, it was that little glimmer of hope was starting to shine a little bit brighter. You right. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it was starting to make me question the way I was thinking, my reality, my perception, you know, uh, trying to question the relationship. What's mm-hmm. really happening here? Mm-hmm. Why am I mm-hmm. allowing this to happen? You know, right. um, at the time. Um, so you were really so- starting to become more open and curious and you were really investigating from a place of fact and truth yes yes seeking the truth right really seeking Seeking the truth like what is actually happening Mm -hmm. here Mm -hmm. um i know this is my life (laughs) i know i have one life but i don't understand what's happening in the life you know (laughs) but it's so great Um, to hear that you really got to that reflective place and and and, uh, really examined it in in detail I was actually very grateful for that because I don't know. I don't know, you know, actually I do. I'll, I'll, this is what happened. I So the following year, my sister came to my house. I lived with my partner at the time, the ex at the time. It was Christmas time, December again, and she showed up um, with a black eye. And I'm sharing a story because she knows we spoke about this. She allowed me to share this story. Okay. Um, she shares it on her own. Uh, pages as well and she showed up with a black eye and I was completely floored because I didn't realize that her relationship was um, physically abusive I knew he was not treating her well Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was to this extent and when we sat at my kitchen she's telling me how she's feeling and she's telling me about what's been going on Mm -hmm. all I'm hearing is myself and yet my situation doesn't look like hers you know what I mean right but somehow you it was all resonating and it it was that your sister's black eye was your eye opener exactly i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't look i couldn't unknow it anymore Mm -hmm. so that really started for me the deepening of the questions Mm -hmm. the deepening of like okay hold on a second Mm -hmm. is this where my life's going Mm -hmm. or that really planted the seeds for that deeper reflective processing that you started to engage with yeah it's like okay really rafiat right Mm -hmm. um so then i then and that's um, how you ended on this on that journey of really seeking your truth and discovering yourself yeah who am i Mm -hmm. you know end up leaving that relationship and really asking, you know, who am I, right? Like, I'm mm-hmm. always searching for purpose and mm-hmm. this greatness. And, you know, it was just like a divine intervention. And the question came in, well, well who are you? How are you going to know what you're going to do in this life if you don't know who you are? Right. <laughs> so I was, oh, I'm asking the wrong question. And so I had to go back mm-hmm. and really sitting down with my creator and really just meditating on mm-hmm. asking questions about what I mean by meditation. I mean, like, asking questions, listening for answers. Um really coming into like what is my identity what am i here for and how does my creator speak to me so i can know the answers as they're coming to me sure um and that kind of started this whole journey now since then of kind of picking up the pieces and understanding that mental health is part of my my journey right i understood when i was feeling depressed and feeling very anxious that i was actually the the emotion that i i I was able to identify after leaving was i was numb I was actually very numb in my life. I, I have used, I'd kind of created this like shell around my heart. So I didn't actually feel mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. I became so much of, so cold mm-hmm. of a person. Mm-hmm. Um, so outside of myself. And that's when I realized, oh, Rafia, you're not yourself. Like the little girl that my mom knows <laughs> is not here anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we need to look at what's happening here. Mm-hmm. Um and so, yeah, it started me on a quest of those get those questions being answered and really understanding, okay, how do I come into presence? Um, my peace became my priority in my life and my kind of like a barometer. If my peace is off, something's off, I need to start paying attention. 
right? Yeah. Um, this has kind of, you know, allowed me to start to really have compassion and grace towards my own mental health journey and and be okay with, yeah, I went through those things. Yes, I experienced those things. Right. Um, but it is because, you know, that's what happened in my life. Right. But also understanding this is how my brain is working now, mm-hmm. right? My brain is used to taking that. It's like a highway. My brain is used to yes. taking that highway. And now mm-hmm. I want to create this path on the left. Right. And so I got to consciously, you know, walk that path and yes. give myself grace because it wants to take the highway it's a computer yes, it's used yeah. to taking the the, the efficient right. route and so you're right? manually <laughs> rewiring right exactly. so that sounds exactly. like it was such a pivoting time for you yes and so very. yeah so very. and so you know Rafia, like when people come to see me for therapy individuals typically they're in one of three places some people are getting started some people when i say getting started meaning like they, they're coming in with a whole you know, slew of things that they want to explore or unpack, or they know that there's something they need to un- explore and unpack, but don't know how to get started in that way. Uh, some people are in the middle. There's maybe something acute they're experiencing or they're navigating, you know, they're in the thick of, of something uh, intense maybe. And some people are looking back and looking back, meaning Maybe they're looking for closure or they're trying to make sense and process some things so they can move forward in life. But no no matter what um, I see, they usually fall into these kind of three areas. So for yourself, what part of the uh, what part of your journey would you say that you're in? Um, Would you say that you're getting started in the middle or looking back in terms of your untold story? I would say I'm looking back like Okay, it's kind of a two-parter. I see you're looking back because I'm trying to use, my whole thing is gaining the wisdom from what I have gone through. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I need help, right? Like I I, I have a therapist today that helps me to kind of look back and see Mm -hmm. and and pull out the gems of what's happening. Um, But I say the second part uh, for me is, it's kind of like a maintenance. I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense mm-hmm. to you. But like, yes, mm-hmm. I'm here on the other side, but it's almost like a maintenance as well. Just like you get an oil change in your car, and yes. you know, like, I, I, you know, you need a it's tune. It's like up, hygiene. Right? You don't just do it once, <laughs> right? Like you got to keep going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's that's what I would say. Okay, but yeah, I guess no, I guess it's your it's your take. But it sounds like from how you're explaining it, it is two parts of looking back, right? There's yes, I get it. And okay. And so you've already shared quite a bit about how your mental health specifically was impacted, right? You talked to me about, you know, you've shared quite openly about, you know, going into a depressive state and, and, you know, experiencing abuse of different kinds and, you know, the, the financial strain and the impact and the thought process. And I'm just wondering if there's anything about your mental health impact that you experienced that you haven't shared yet. Like, I mean, I know you were even thinking about, you even shared openly about, you know, suicidal ideation and having a plan or just even fleeting thoughts of, you know, what would it be like if, you know, this car just kind of ended up here or, you know, there were so many different things that you shared. Uh, and I'm, I have a lot of respect and, and gratitude that you could do that. I'm very humbled that you shared such with such vulnerability. I'm just curious if there was anything else about this area that you may want to share a little bit more of or if anything got left behind. Um, what comes to mind when you ask that is anxiety. I think the one thing I want to mm. share is that um, I didn't realize, you know, that I was a person, one, living with anxiety for such a long time. So what did it look like for you? If you're saying that you experienced anxiety, what did that look like for you? How did it manifest? Yeah, it manifested as rumination and Mm. just really like picking apart conversations with people and really just like, oh, no, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I should have said this. Oh, my gosh, why did I do this? Um, So rumination is you're Mm -hmm. just dwelling on thoughts. Your your thoughts are on repeat. And then you're being mm-hmm. hard on yourself. You've got the self doubt exactly. and self or yeah. the inner it's critic. It's almost loathing. It's almost loathing. Like mm-hmm. I wouldn't even say it's just doubt. It was loathing. Like it was becoming really a hatred of why I did things. Why did you have to do this? You know, it's it's really. I had like as you said before. I used to be okay, by so any means like necessary. Not even, yeah. So self doubt right? is so a the low same, level. It's the same. Yeah, it was like <laughs> yeah. the same, but like it, it's completely directed right. internally now. So it's like. 
even a step above inner critic, yeah. right? Because you're not yeah. just criticizing yourself, you're hating on yourself. So yeah. to me, that's like there was self-shaming going on. Yes. And Big self, time. like rage on self. Right now. Like you're now, and so yeah. because you're shaming yourself, now you're angry with yourself. Yeah. You know, why am I here? Why didn't mm-hmm. things Questioning, out? you know, right. everything, okay. everything, you know that perfectionist in me was like, you should have had it together by now, mm-hmm, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but, should have had it together yeah. by now. Holy smokes. Yeah. yeah. But you know, like, as I, you know, was saying like owning my mental health has helped me to understand that like, this is, this is just how I processed at the time. Mm-hmm. I give myself a lot of grace and I made, I look back and I say like that girl made the best decisions that she could at that time. Yeah. Exactly. Right? With um, all the knowledge and information that you had, which you might not have, like the stuff you know now, you might not have had then. Exactly. So with what you what you were working with, you, you could give yourself some grace. Yeah. So that's, that's beautiful. Been, that's been really um, big for me. Yeah. Okay. That is huge. So given that you can start seeing your pivots and, you know, things that you were shifting and what you were being intentional and more conscious, you know, doing with, you know, conscious awareness. What would you want your key message to the listeners of the show be? What would you want them to to know? I would want them to know two things come to mind. One, to be curious about yourself. You know, it's okay to question your, your thoughts with love. But also, like, it's okay if you're not okay. Like, I know it's very mm-hmm. cliche nowadays, but, like, I just never gave myself permission to not be okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Always pushing, always going through. Um, but if I understood then that it's okay to feel the way I was feeling, mm-hmm. I think I would have given myself a little space. And in that space, I could have figured out... Um, you know, better course of actions, hopefully, anyways. <laughs> right. Yeah, but the it's okay if you're not okay is permission to feel. Yeah, yeah. When you have permission to feel, you're actually able to check in with yourself and pay attention to your internal process. Because there's so much wisdom on the inside. Like, I really believe we got everything we need. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we're so intelligent, like, as beings, we're so intelligent um, we have the capacity for so much, um, yet we're, well, for me anyways, I was the most scared of spending time with myself. So mm-hmm. how can I allow myself to, to feel if I don't even want to spend, you know, outside of sleep or doing, you know, you're just always right. occupied by something, sure. right? Yeah. And so, yeah, really learning, like, part of my journey is like, yeah, it's okay to be with my thoughts. It's okay to be with me how am I feeling right now you know or even sensations you know what am I actually you know in my body feeling Mm -hmm. right now spiritually or energetically what am I feeling right now yeah Yeah. that's those are really great words of wisdom thank you so Rafia I'm curious about what is your game changer inspiration that's close to you that reflects your untold story is there like a mantra or like an inspirational quote or book or a person or even an event that really spoke to you that that helped you. I know you mentioned when your sister came to your door with the black eye, Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. that was a very pivotal moment for you for your self realization. But Mm -hmm. maybe just was there anything that gave you encouragement or motivation or something that really helped you anchor into the direction that you were able to get to or get into? Um, for me, it's my faith. Like, I believe that there's a creator bigger than I. And so when I am feeling, you know, thrown with the wind and I'm, you know, all over the place, I anger in and the fact that there is, a, you know, a higher power out there that knows the plan and the way for me. And so even if it looks cloudy to me, he, I, I call him a he, mm-hmm. he knows where I'm going, right? And mm-hmm. so if I tap into him, if I get back close, um, if I can just silence a little bit and hear, because he's also in me, then I can kind of get to where I'm going. So that's that's a very big inspiration for me uh, to just to just keep, keep going. Your faith and, yeah, and you yeah, kept keep believing, going. and you keep believing. Because yeah. that's what it was, right? Mm-hmm. I realize now that all of this with the mental health, it's belief, right? It's um, it has been a battle 
of Mm -hmm. my mind. It has been a battle of my heart, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so if I can continue to hold on true to me, uh, then I'll be okay, you know? Right. Awesome. So then what's a cause or an organization that's been impactful to you on your journey that you would like to give a shout out to? For sure. I'm going to shout out Toy and Crando Coaching because when I first left that relationship and, um, you know, things were crazy, I, I decided to jump in and take this uh, this coaching program. And it was about your money mindset because, mm-hmm. you know, as I said, I thought everything, if I could just get my right. money together. Exactly. <laughs> right. But what I learned in the program was so much more. And mm-hmm. um, it really gave me a structure and a permission to look within. Right. And um, learning, you know, journaling, things like that through that program. But I really got to understand the feelings of being numb, which was huge for me, and being absent from my life. Um, so I always give them, they'll always hold a special place in my heart because um, I realized then it was more than money, right? Mm-hmm. I thought it was always just money, but then there is where I realized, oh, no, there's there's a root system happening underneath right. <laughs> with the surface. Yeah. Absolutely. It's always more than just about money. And the sooner you you come to that conclusion, the more connected you are to yourself. Absolutely. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So tell me the platforms. How can people connect with you if they would like to? So I'm on Instagram. Instagram. Uh, Where else? Rafiat. Uh, Amid underscore co. Okay. Uh, LinkedIn. I'm fresh on LinkedIn, so if you're on LinkedIn, <laughs> um, I'm I'm just dabbling over there. You're building. Really excited. You're building. Yeah, building. Okay. Um, and you have a website. website Raf- at racketamid.com okay. um, and in my podcast follow your first mind um, that's where you can connect with me amazing that sounds lovely um, so we actually have a show notes page so if people go to dare to share.co your podcast episode 70 is right there they click on your name or the episode number and there's an entire page about you and there are links to connect with you directly. So we'll make sure that these are all there. Thank you. Yeah. Honestly, Salima, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for facilitating um, and really just holding space for me to to share. It honestly has been a genuine pleasure. And Rafia, guess what? What? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, you've just dared yourself to share. Congrats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we went on to say thank you. And it's like, wait, you just did this. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah, this is huge. It's like, so this big. Is, you, did, huge. you just did some really big unveiling today. And honestly, Rafiat, I would like to just take a moment to express my gratitude for the story that you've so shared today. I am humbled. I mean, at any point... For any person, speaking about money and finances is messy and Mm -hmm. it can be very uncomfortable. So to unpack your story where there was so much, like such an enmeshment of your mental well-being and being so heavily affected by the conditioning of financial success and all the mindset shifting you've worked through. My goodness, this can only encourage others to delayer their experiences and tap into their core work as well. So I so. am sitting here and I'm truly grateful to have been able to hear and witness your story today. So thank you for the deep conversation and for all the daring and sharing. This has been incredible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. I hope so too. I hope that people can also be liberated Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, money is just a tool for us to use and it will amplify the good that's in your heart. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so I hope that more people can, can use it and do good things. And once again, Rafia, thank you for being part of Dare to Share Your Untold Story and helping to be a voice in breaking down the barriers of mental stigma. To all of our listeners, If you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and you want to be part of breaking down barriers of mental stigma, I invite you to go wherever you are listening to the episode and hit subscribe. Leave us a comment or a review of the episode and maybe how you relate to it. To learn more about what we offer, visit www.daretoheal.co. And if you are feeling ready and brave to share, please submit your story by visiting www.daretoshare.co. Thanks for joining in.